Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And let me just read one verse for a scripture reading. We'll be out through the whole passage tonight. But let me just read verse number 7. It says this. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. But we have this treasure. We have this treasure. Let's, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for your word and how applicable it is in our lives every single day. I pray that it would uh, challenge us and convict us tonight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, how many of you have noticed that we seem to live in a constant news cycle and it seems that the news is always bad? Anyone ever notice that? I think that would be an understatement. Uh, someone did a study and reported that uh, 90% of news is negative news. And you might be shocked and think, well, that's a little too low. You know, I thought it might be higher than that, you know. Uh, 90% of the news is negative news. The Industry Week did a report uh, several years ago, and they, they said that bad news is more likely to attract a casual reader's eye than good news. It's a secret journalists have known for years, that bad news gets more attention than good news. So I went and grabbed a few newspapers this morning just to see, uh, 90, is 90% of the newspapers uh, news today actually negative news? And uh, the LA Times, there were seven stories on the front page, and six of the seven stories on the front page were negative. They were negative headlines. Uh, another newspaper I grabbed was the uh, USA Today. There were five major stories on the front cover and five out of five of the stories. You can grab them yourself if you want to. You be the judge, but five out of five were negative stories. The AV Press uh, was actually not so bad. Uh, two out of seven on the front page, uh, but they also have a second front, and on the second front, there were seven out of seven negative stories, all right? So bad news everywhere. This report from Industry Week said that even when a story was good, that journalists will often find a negative angle on that story because people are more likely to read. So even if it's positive news, they're going to take the one negative aspect and float that up to the first several lines or the headline because it's more likely to get read. There was one international paper that did, uh, did a test and they actually just ran positive stories for a week, nothing but positive stories in their newspaper, and they lost two-thirds of their readership over the course of a week. And so we're kind of attracted to bad news, but I've got some good news tonight. Are you guys ready for some good news? Here's the good news, that God is still on the throne. He's still in control. The gospel is still at, life, at work in the hearts and lives of men. We have some good news, and we're going to look at this good news here in this passage. The, the good news uh, is really found in verse number four. It says that it, it, we find this phrase, the glorious gospel of Christ. So we, we read the phrase a moment ago that we have this treasure and that's some great news, that we have this treasure, something that cannot be taken away from us, something that is of immeasurable value. We have this treasure. And what is this treasure? The treasure is the gospel, the good news. Literally means good news. In this passage, we find, we'll, we'll come to this later on, these words, trouble, perplexed, distressed, despair, forsaken. And sometimes I think yeah, these words can apply to us. But let me tell you that we don't have to be these things because of Jesus Christ. That's the good news, that he has conquered death, hell, and the grave. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the treasure that has been given to us. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, in whom are hid all the treasures. Later it says, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So in Christ are all the treasures. So this treasure is the gospel at work in our life. So this, this is meaningful to us. And it's something as believers we ought to be reminded of frequently. So the Apostle Paul, in Scripture we find two letters to the Corinthians. And the first letter was a letter that was a correcting letter. And the second letter here is more of a personal letter. And, and we'll look at this, but Paul is defending himself in some regard in this passage. But he's also just rehearsing things. And I believe it is advantageous for us 
as believers for time to time just to rehearse the goodness of God and what the gospel means in our life. So let's look at the treasures that have been entrusted to us, this treasure that we have, the gospel. What does it mean and what changes? Well, I want to look at three things that change because of this treasure that has been given to us. The first thing that changes are our privileges. As believers, we have privileges from God. Uh, the greatest privilege would be that of salvation, entering into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. In this passage here, it, it, it uses uh, the, uh, verse number six, says, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So this saving knowledge of the glory of God through Jesus Christ. This is the greatest privilege that we have in life. And it is a privilege that cannot be revoked. And we ought to be thankful for that. So no matter how dark or gloomy the news cycle may be, we'll never lose our salvation. And we can always come back to the fact that we have a relationship with God because of his son, Jesus Christ. What a great privilege. If in this life we only have salvation, we've been given more than we deserve. You see, this privilege is not a privilege that we earned, but a, a privilege that we were given. It is nothing that we did, not by our works of righteousness, but only because of his grace and mercy in our life. And so we find the privileges here of, our, of, of, of this tre the, the treasure, the privileges are salvation, that's the gospel, but also service. So look here in verse number one. It says, therefore, seeing we have received this ministry as we have received mercy. So that phrase, as we have received mercy, is speaking of our salvation. But as we received mercy, as we entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we also received another privilege. And that is the privilege of being included in the work of God. We weren't just saved to, 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 to sit down and fill a pew. We were saved to serve. There's no greater privilege than to know Jesus Christ and then to be included. We are now joint heirs. We are now adopted into the family of God. And this is a great privilege that we are saved and that we can serve, that we have been given this ministry. And then we find this phrase, we'll see it again, that we faint not. So because of these things, we can take heart. We don't need to lose heart. We can keep going. We can, even in difficult times and difficult circumstances, because of these truths, the fact that we've been saved and we've been given a purpose, we can keep going. We don't have to faint. We don't have to get uh, 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 discouraged or distressed. We can keep serving. So our salvation and our services, our service. So with our service, there are some rights. We are a child of God. There are some things that are given to us, but there are also some responsibilities found here in this passage. And so Paul says this, as he wrote, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. So this is one of the responsibilities that we have in service. So by the way, we, we, we teach this to the teenagers. When we are saved, we are saved to serve. And every minister is a minister, right? Uh, there's not a different tiers of Christianity. Uh, when we were saved, we were saved to serve. And so as we serve, there are some responsibilities in this service, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. This is speaking to those hidden practices, the thoughts, behaviors that would bring shame if uncovered. And then he says, not walking in craftiness. Uh, the same word for craftiness is used later in the book when uh, Paul said that Satan beguiled Eve. He's speaking of trickery or craftiness. And this was this is prevalent here uh, uh, in, in Corinth. This is, this is something that uh, Paul had addressed before and is addressing now, that there are those who would seek to trick new believers. So not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully. And of course, again, Paul is speaking to an issue that was abounding in that time, that there were those who were using, abusing the words of God. He was warning against the misuse of scripture. Uh, even as anyone gets, uh, uh, stands up and stands behind this pulpit and opens God word, God's word, we should examine the text against what's being said, no matter who's say, saying it. Uh, I'm thankful that we uh, get to serve in a place where God's word is handled 
well and appropriately. I am grateful that this week through the Fine Arts Tournament, there will be uh, young men in our youth group. They'll be nervous, but they have practice, and they, they're learning how to handle the Word of God. To misuse the Word of God would mean to uh, just remove a verse from context to make a point that the Scripture was not saying. Or maybe just using a text to promote a hobby, hobby horse or maybe reading into the text something that's not there. And this is prevalent. And Paul was saying, as ministers of the gospel, we need to handle the word of God appropriately. Now, this applies to more than just who stands behind a pulpit. This applies to every single one of us, whether a pulpit or a lectern across this campus, or even as we, uh, as Scripture says, commend ourselves to others' conscience. As we, as we share the Word of God, we need to share it honestly and openly. So, and then he said this, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And so, believers, we have received mercy, and with that, we've received a ministry to then tell others about Christ. So let's keep reading. Verse number three, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Let me make a point here. The gospel always works. Right? If, if, if someone's not receiving the gospel, it's not a problem with the gospel. That's what Paul's saying here. He says their eyes have been blinded. Now, Paul knew something about being blind, did he not? Uh, in, on the road to Damascus, he, he experienced that intense blindness. Later, this is somewhat of a mission statement of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter number 26. He said, as part of his personal mission, is to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, and that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which is sanctified by faith that is in me. So what is the antidote for this blindness? We, we encounter people every day. You work beside people every day who maybe are lost and blind. That is their spiritual condition. Well, what is the answer of that? Well, Paul gives us the answer in verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen. That's the antidote for spiritual blindness. Not to preach ourselves, but to preach Christ, to lift Christ up. And ourselves for Jesus' servants for Jesus' sake. And then again, verse number six, which we read, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. And th this, is, this is awesome. This is a, a reference back to Genesis chapter number one. The same God that said, let there be light, hath allowed the glorious light of the gospel to shine into our hearts. That is a treasure that we have, that we have experienced the gospel, the glory of God, to give light unto the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What a privilege that we have to be called the child of God, to be involved in service alongside, together with God. This is a privilege of the treasure that we have. But another aspect of this treasure is not just our privilege, but we've been given some possessions. We've been given some possessions, the Holy Spirit. We've been given, uh, we'll see here in this passage, the power of God. So we've been given some things as children of God. Verse number seven says this, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So what is an earthen vessel? Not a phrase we use all the time. Well, in biblical times, there were, there were these clay pots that they would keep food and materials. And uh, it, was, it was, I think we got a picture of a, of a few of them, something Something like this. This is the pots that they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in. The point with the pots is the pots themselves were not valuable. Here, here's a pot where uh, they found money in it. There's actually a story in Matthew chapter 13 that Jesus is telling the story where there's, there was, uh, there was uh, money that was found in, in, a, in, a, in a pot. And so uh, here, here we have these pots, but these pots are not valuable in and of themselves. In fact, they were... They were disposable. They were invaluable. They, the only thing they did was potentially carry something that was of value. What was important was not the pots themselves, but what was in the pots. I saw this week that Purell hand sanitizer was going on Craigslist for $250, right? 
If you're willing to pay $250 for some Perel hand sanitizer, I've got something else to sell you after the service. Just come up and see me. It's amazing. Now, now why, why would they do this? It wasn't the container itself. It was what they were saying was in the container. Because what's in the container is what actually brings value to it. Now listen. What this passage is telling us is this. We are the human containers of the excellency of God. What we bring to salvation, we bring nothing except for the need of it, right? We are just clay pots. We bring nothing to, to, to salvation. God doesn't need us, yet he includes us. And so we are just earthen vessels. The gospel contains the most profound truth ever known to the world, and yet we are fragile, frail, broken humanity, redeemed by Christ, is entrusted with that gospel message. I'm glad that God uses imperfect people, aren't you? Paul was ridiculed at times, and he was, even later in this passage, he, he alludes to it, that there were those who mocked him because of his speech or because of how he looked. And uh, in Galatians, he alludes to the fact that maybe he had a problem with one of his eyes, and maybe it was ugly to look upon, and, and he, was, he was attacked for that. But, but you know what? He chose not to defend himself, but rather in those instances to defend the gospel is what he chose to do. Because God uses imperfect people. Abraham, Moses, David, Elijah, Peter, Paul, Isaiah, they were all just clay pots. God uses human, frail, imperfect people to declare the gospel. And why is that? So that in the end, who gets the glory? When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they they, they said, we found the Dead Sea, not just the pots that they were in. When they found the treasure that was in the field, it was a big deal, the treasure that was, it wasn't, the pots didn't get the glory. In the end, God gets the glory, but we get the privilege of being used. We are just earthen vessels. We live in a society that prides itself in self-sufficiency. But we find in John chapter 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. I think one thing that the, the fragile news cycle has taught us in the last few days is that maybe we don't have it all together as we think we do. Uh, maybe we don't have things under control like we, well, like we think. We, maybe we aren't as self-sufficient as, as we believe we are. And maybe this will be an opening for us to present the gospel to others in our community and around the world. Paul later said, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For, in my, strength, uh, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore... I will rather, rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecution and distress, distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, I am strong. So what does it mean that we have uh, 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 this treasure? It means that we have God's power that's available to us, his, his power, the excellency of his power. Uh, I remember in high school, uh, we would have football practice, and sometimes after football practice, we'd go to a small gymnasium that we had over in the Student Life Center, and we would lift weights. And sometimes when we were doing the bench press, uh, my coach would get up behind me, and I would push as hard as I can to find that amount that where I almost could bring the bar up to the top with that amount, and, and, but then I couldn't. And what the, what the coach would do uh, would stand behind me and spot me, and he would help me out. And he added his strength to my strength. Now, I technically didn't get any stronger. So our strength plus God's strength doesn't mean that we're actually any stronger, but his strength through us. Um, One author put it this way. Do we do not become powerful? We remain weak. There's this idea, kind of a self-help idea that I'm going to borrow God's power and then I'm going to be stronger. No, no, no. It is when we are weak that he is strong. It is in his, in our weakness that we find his strength. We do not grow in power. We grow in weakness. We go from weakness to weakness, which is to remain vessels of his power, ever weak and ever strong. That is a privilege that we have as believers to be used of God and, and when we are weak, he is strong. Our weakness is the foundation for his strength. And so we find that God's power is available to us through us. So we are earthen vessels 
uh, possessing his power, but, but how is that power often manifest? How, do, how does the unsaved see that power in our life? Most often through the peace of God that's reigning in our life. How is God's power evidenced in your life? It's not that we are superhero Christians and, wow, look at this person did and look at this person did. But God's power is most often evidenced through the peace that is evident in our life. Paul continues here and he, and he, he gives this, uh, this incredible uh, literary circle, so to speak. He's going he's gonna to hammer these truths over and over and over again with these, these paradoxes. And we read them here in scripture. He says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. So what he's talking about here is the, the, the Greek words uh, allude to this fact that uh, it's, we were being squeezed, troubled. It's just like a vice grip coming down on you. But yet he wasn't crushed. He was not distressed, in trouble, but not distressed. And then he said, we were perplexed, but not in despair. Uh, puzzled at times, yes. Perplexed, confused, yes. But had he lost one ounce of hope? No. And this is the paradox for us as, as Christians. Yes, this is distressful, but we haven't come undone. And uh, yes, this is perplexing, but we're not in despair because we know who's in control. Persecuted, but not forsaken. This word persecuted speaks to being hunted down. And there were times where Paul was, was hunted down throughout the city, but not forsaken. He was never abandoned by God. Cast down, but not destroyed. This implies being hit or struck with a weapon. Again, Paul experienced this. In Acts chapter number 14, he was stoned. The Bible says, having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. He had been cast down. But when the disciples came and they gathered around him, guess whose eye popped open? The apostle Paul. You see, he was cast down, yet he was not destroyed. I think sometimes we think the privilege, we, we are privileged to be saved. We're privileged to, to serve. But guess what? The Bible also tells us that when we are suffered, when we suffer, we are privileged to suffer. In Acts chapter number five, when the disciples were stoned there in that instance for, uh, uh, for, for continuing to preach the gospel, at the end of the passage, they walked away and they continued rejoicing. Why? That they were counted worthy to suffer. Listen, when we suffer for Christ's sake, that is a privilege. Paul said, even in these things, this is a, a privilege. He said in verse number 11 here, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Wouldn't that be an awesome prayer for every single one of us, that the life of Jesus would be made manifest in our mortal f flesh. What Paul is speaking here is about dying to self, the mortification, the crucifixion of the flesh, the crucified life. And so we have in this treasure, we have uh, this possession, and, and, and we have these privileges. But let me draw your attention finally to this last point. We have a new perspective. Because of the treasure that has been given to us, we now see things differently. Verse number 16 says this, for which cause we faint not. So here we are, we see in verse number one, he begins with, we faint not. Now having come through all this, now because of God's power, because of a personal relationship, because of this peace that we have experienced in our life, because of all these things, it doesn't matter what happened, we faint not. We have no reason to lose hope ever because of Jesus Christ. And that should change our perspective. We don't have to look at the worst news cycle and despair because God's in control. We can be perplexed, but we're not distressed. We, we, can, we can be uh, hurt by something, but we haven't given up hope because of Jesus. Verse number 17 says this. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us for more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. For our light affliction, the worst day that we've ever experienced, but a light affliction. And the grand, why? Because as believers, our perspective changes. Because what God has done for us, what he has given, when we see this life in light of eternity, it's a light affliction. 
I find it curious, this phrase here, the, the weight, the eternal weight of glory. You know, sometimes we think of the weight of our difficulties. Has anyone ever talked to you and they're like, oh, this is just bearing down on me. This, this trial that I'm bearing or this difficult situation or my fa- finances or whatever, you know, uh, poor relationships, these things are just bearing. We think of the weight of those things. But do we ever consider the weight, the eternal weight of his glory? It far outweighs any light affliction that we may face. Verse number 18 says this, For uh, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. That is the Christian life of faith. We're going to have this eternal perspective. Well, we're not just going to look at the things that are seen and the things that are reported, but we're going to look at life through the things that are not seen to the things that God is doing, to the power that is given to us. For the things which are seen, they're temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. I heard this story back in 2015, December of 2015. There was a family that had lost a loved one and so they went to Phoenix to help clean out the garage of a loved one that had passed away and an elderly, an elder, an elder, elderly person that had passed away, this, this relative. And as they were cleaning out the garage, they came across a Kobe Bryant poster in the garage. And as they looked at this poster of Kobe Bryant, they saw that on the poster that this poster was signed. And so they got excited because this is a signed poster. It it has to be worth something, right? So they called an appraiser and they said, we're all excited. We were cleaning the garage out, getting ready to throw a whole bunch of things away. And we found this poster. We know it's worth something. It's signed by Kobe Bryant. They asked the appraiser to come out and look at the poster. And he did. And when he came to look at the poster, though, he, he saw something. Something caught his eye. Not the Kobe Bryant poster, but something that was behind the Kobe Bryant poster. And it was this painting. And the painting had suffered a heat damage, smoke damage, moisture damage. But he, he noticed it and he, he thought it might be worth something. So he looked into it and sure enough, this was an original painting by Jackson Pollock. And this painting was estimated to be worth, by the appraiser, $15 million. How many of you would like to find a painting like that in your garage? Wouldn't that be awesome? Now, this changed everything for that family. They thought they had this post, you know, a Kobe Bryant poster that was maybe worth four or five, six hundred dollars. But instead, they got the news. What happened here? An appraiser went there. And while they were all enamored with one thing, the, the appraiser saw value in something else. And may I tell you, as believers, while the world gets enamored with one thing, we find value in something else. This earthen treasure that cannot be taken away from us, that we cannot lose, that we are privileged to have, to have, to serve. And if God allows us even to suffer for his sake and for his glory. So let's keep our eyes focused on him.